Good evening. Welcome to Faith and Fellowships uh, uh, panel for kids through teens. And we have three authors with us tonight on our panel. We have Phyllis Wheeler, we have Chelsea Elliott, and we have Becky Van Vliet. And I'm going to ask each of them to give a brief introduction to their selves and to their featured book. So we'll go ahead and just go ahead and start with Phyllis. Well, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to uh, meet you. So I, um, I'm one of these people who set a goal at age 13 to write a children's book. And uh, so that actually, uh, that took me many years to accomplish that with a lot of detours. So I wrote for daily newspapers. Uh, I worked on airplanes as a mechanical engineer. And then I raised four children, including triplet boys, and doing some homeschooling along the way. So I lived in a variety of places over the course of my life. I lived as a child in pre-civil rights Mississippi. And then as an adult, in, uh, we raised our children in an African-American neighborhood here in St. Louis. Uh, so most of my adult life, I have called St. Louis home. And uh, yeah, that's about that about me. So now if you're interested in my book, so here's the book. I think you can see if I hold it under my chin, right? Um, the Long Shadow is a racial reconciliation novel featuring time travel. So, um, 14 year old Richie, who is from white suburbia, thinks it's a good idea to run away from his guardian until he is whisked back in time 50 years. He's fighting to survive a freak storm and he's afraid to accept help from a black man. So as Morris mentors him in woodsman skills, a friendship develops. Richie wants to repay his life debt to Morris and embarks on another trip in time to 1923 in Missouri. So can he prevent the lynching of Morris's grandfather? So that's the nutshell on that book and on me. And what's the age level you're looking at for the audience? Uh, 12 to 14 is the what I'm aiming at. There's been a lot of adults who've read it who liked it too. I've got a lot of good feedback and it did win an award, a Moonbeam Award so far. All right, Chelsea, tell us a little bit about yourself and your featured book. <coughs> Everyone, so my name is Chelsea Elliott and my featured book is my background because um, I can't find the copy right now. It took me a long time. <laughs> but it's Natalie's Not So Fun Play Date. And I write books about um, social and emotional learning. They're about my daughter, Natalie. And um, I don't know where my finger's pointing. And that's her little sister, Olivia. So I just love to like incorporate people and other things that we love in our books. And that's her best friend, Addie, and our dog, Veronica, that are all from the story. So um, this book is about Natalie, as you can hear here in the background here, Natalie, Natalie, inside point, guys, inside point. Um, so it's about Natalie playing her favorite game with her best friend, playing tic-tac-toe, and she starts to lose and she gets really upset. So she goes to her mom and she's screaming about how unfair it is that she keeps losing. And then she goes through all of these um, different anger management techniques to help calm her body, not necessarily get rid of her anger, but to help her see it's okay to be angry, but here are some ways that you can manage that while you're feeling that so that you're not, you know, throwing things or lashing out at other people. So um, I love writing books like that. The first book uh, is Natalie's, Natalie the Monster Slayer, and it's about her um, finding bravery in her fear. So, you know, saying, you know, I'm scared in this moment, but I can still be brave. So I just love writing books about emotions uh, for my, my little children. And it also, 
started, I never considered myself a writer or a creative person at all. So whenever someone's like, oh, I'm not creative, um, I always tell them, like, I never considered myself creative either. But it started with a book that my husband wrote when he was in second grade, and he always wanted to publish it. And so I published it for him for Christmas one year. And it went viral for a bit because he's a big emotional guy, so cute. But people kept reaching out to me saying, oh my gosh, I've, I've had this book idea since my kids were little and I tell it to my grandkids now, but I never thought I could do it. So I started helping people publish their books too because I feel like everybody has something to share with kids and everybody has a story. They should have the opportunity to publish a book at least once in their lifetime. So um, that's something that I absolutely love to do. And then from my books, I created a card game for kids um, based on Natalie's character. And now she has six other little friends that are a part of the EQ Kids crew that help teach kids about their emotions based off of the feeling wheel, the emotion wheel, and uh, teaching them different behavior techniques. So all of this has been done in literally the last year. I think I published that my first book last October. And now I have two books, two journals, and the card game. So anything is possible. <laughs> that's always my, my spiel there, but that's me, that's my book. All right, and we'll go with Becky next. Uh, it looks like Yvonne has joined us. Right now, everybody's sharing a short biography and a little bit about their book they're featuring. But we'll go to Becky while you have time to prepare. Thank you. Okay, um, good to be here. I was a part of this last year, and Phyllis, I will tell you that I've read your book and a few months ago, I put a review on Amazon. So I highly recommend it as, as an adult. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my featured book is um, Harvey, the Traveling Harmonica. But um, I have to tell you about another book that led up to my featured book. Um, I'm a retired teacher and a retired principal. And um, I never thought about doing any writing, but a couple of years ago, I set out to write um, a true story children's book that I just wanted to preserve in my family. And it was um, about this little skirt, this traveling skirt that I wore in 1955. And my sisters all wore it and it started traveling through our family. Um, so it traveled around for more than 70 years. And through three generations and my granddaughters have, have worn it. And so I thought, you know, I'd really like to preserve this story. It's just a really neat family story. And um, there's a story behind the story. So I set out to just uh, write this story and thought I'd self-publish. And if nothing else, it would just be a keepsake for my family. Well, the further I got into it, um, it I was able to have it traditionally published and uh, it became like the stepping stone for my next book. And so I thought, wow, I, I really enjoyed preserving the, this memory of this little skirt, this true story in my family, which maybe, oh, and here's the skirt. I just have to show you <laughs> this um, seven, 70 year old skirt. It was made in 1948. And um, I started thinking, you know, there's other objects in my family that have traveled around through three generations. And I think I'll start writing about some of these other things. So um, I, this, it's a true story about this little harmonica that traveled around for three generations. And um, so once again, I'm just I'm preserving the memory of it. It won an award, a purple, the Purple Dragonfly Award. So my third one is coming out uh, in March, uh, Roxy the Traveling Walker. And after that will be Wally, um, the traveling watch. So after all is said and done, I will have a series of these traveling books. And what they all have in common is that they are all inanimate objects that have become characters in a, in a story. And they were traveling through three generations with some kind of a special message. All right, thank you. And Yvonne? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your book. Okay, thank you. My featured book is, and I know it's backwards, ABCs from the Bible. Um, I had never planned on being a writer. Um, many years ago, 
it's been, well, many years ago, my uh, husband and I started doing a bunch of mission work. And after we'd done, we had done that for almost 20 years, I got the feeling that I needed to write down about the stories that occurred on the mission field. And so my first book ended up being a memoir of that journey for 20 years. Um, and then I've also written a prayer journal and a Bible study on 1 Corinthians. Um, then speed up a little bit to more current time. Uh, my, my children started having my grandchildren and I looked around and I thought to myself, you know, there's not a lot of really good Christian books out there for young children. Um, and so I got, it's like, I've always heard the saying, if you don't see the book that you wanna read, then write it. Um, and after having some experience, then I decided I'd write my first children's book, which is The Sad Little Wildflower. And then I went on to, and this is a story of how when we're with Jesus, he can teach us that all of us have a purpose, no matter if it's not what we're expecting it to be. Um, and then ABC from the Bible, my featured book is an ongoing poem written in a poem style of, for example, A is for angels. Um, and so I wanted to use those to teach my grandchildren about Jesus um, and about faith and that. And so I wrote these and my fifth book is coming out sometime early next year. Go you know, again, going back to my mission roots. Um, I thought, you know what, when we take any of our kids on mission trips, they learn so much about other cultures. So I wanted to focus in on that. And this, I think it'll be a series. It's a one book to start with called Mary the Missionary. And she's a young, uh, young girl and she travels, she goes to Sunday school and they sing some songs about how Jesus loves the children of the world. And she comes home and asks some questions to her parents and they decide to go on a mission trip and take her with us, with them and they go to Kenya and she learns a lot about what it's like to be from another culture and how you know every culture has wonderful things in it but it also helps you to appreciate what you have in your own culture um, and again hopefully that'll morph into other Mary the Missionary books so that's kind of short short bio on my background. Mm -hmm. All right so a lot of you covered some of the things I was going to ask but um, some of you are self-published and some of you are traditionally published. Uh, for this round, I would like you to speak to uh, the advantages, the ease, the difficult, the challenge, the, um, diff you know, what was it like getting to that publication um, time? So we will just go right down the list again. Phyllis, want to address that? Well, I am uh, with a small press that is a traditional publisher and I do have an agent. So what you really, if you want, if you want to like to get published by the big guys, you have to have an agent. So getting an agent is, um, it's, it's a huge quest and it's very difficult because there are so many people competing for their attention. So the way I got my agent was through my local writers guild here in St. Louis, St. Louis Writers Guild. They had a little conference where they just uh, asked some uh, a collection of agents to show up by a video link, and also they had some agents that were there in person, and um, that's how I got it. And I've been to um, I can't tell you how many writers conferences I've been to where the agent thing did not pan out. And in fact, writing for children, especially in the Christian arena, is uh, very difficult to get an agent. I must say, there, there's hardly any agents that spe specialize in it, but I don't know, it's just my time to get an agent, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so um, yeah. pray a lot, that's what you gotta do is pray. And so if you don't have an agent, there, there are, you know, in children's publishing, there are ways to, uh, uh, there are editors who will, you know, at publishing houses who will look at your work. So you have to like, they, they announce, you know, open season, like uh, I'm accepting manuscripts between February and, and April or something like that. So you have to target these people and be on top of them and send them stuff at the right time so it's uh 
And of course, you must have something, a, a manuscript that they uh, would love to have. You've got it, this, this, you know, there's no lukewarm in the publishing industry. You know, they have to adore your manuscript. So you've got to uh, work on that, uh, um, you know, with your, um, your writer friends, your beta readers, your everybody friends, you know, and say, look, look we've got to get this manuscript to where it just knocks your socks off. And if it's not there yet, tell me. So then you just keep working on it. And, you know, if you, I don't know, the Lord may bring, bring you success. All right, Chelsea, you want to tell us your publication process there? It's a process. Um, being self-published is really hard, but I like those types of challenges and like figuring things out. I like the creating part and the attention to detail um, and just having control over the process, but that's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, it's not the worst thing, but um, yeah, I'm just really picky about things. So I like having that control over it. So that's why I prefer that over traditional, but marketing is all on you. You know, everything is all on you and that can be a huge challenge. So just building a really good team around you is, is definitely the best, um, the best way to find success on that journey, self-publishing path. Okay. And Becky, you said you were traditional. How did you find your publisher? Well, I, I just have to tell you, um, it, you know, God just opened that door for me. And like I said, with this very first book about the little skirt, um, I just was so green. This was just a couple of years ago, 2019. I had never embarked on anything like this. And so I just really started um, reading other authors' blogs and getting on some um, some newsletters. And I got in touch with a, an editor from... Uh, Christian Editor Connection, and I have to be honest, she helped me tremendously, but when all was said and done, um, my my editor friend, she was a freelance editor, recommended um, Elf Lake Publishing, which is a small Christian press, and Phyllis, is that who uh, published your book? Elk Lake, yeah. Elk Lake, yes, okay, I, I thought so, and so um, she just said, you know, I'll help you with your proposal. Let's just see what happens. There's a couple other small Christian presses that I'm familiar with. And then you can start thinking about if, you know, you get rejections, you know, I've got some ideas for um, um, self-publication too. So I just, I really just didn't know anything. So I sent the proposal to Elf Lake and, and they, they took it. And I just, to me, that was just an open door from, from God that, that's where this book needed to land. And, um, and so now I continue to work with them for, for these other children's books. So, um, but going back to Chelsea, um, you know, Chelsea, you're right, as far as, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces, I think of the self-publication, but I did check into that. And I think if you, um, you know, familiarize yourself and talk to other people who have self-published, you know, I think, I think that's a, a very good path to be on as well, um, because you definitely have that control, and, uh, you know, there's some advantages with that. Okay, Avon, you want to adjust this? Yes, I went with a traditional publisher. Um, as I said, my first book was the memoir of the mission trip, and like Becky, had never planned on doing anything with writing. <laughs> um, and so I really, when I was praying about this and I wrote it, it's like, okay, Lord, if you want this out there, you've got to help me because I have no clue what I'm doing. And I start going to some writers conferences where you could pitch to different publishing companies. And again, going at this as a greenhorn, and um, I was going to attend a, a second conference and I thought well I'll go to this first smaller one in Oklahoma City to kind of get my feet wet um, and kind of learn the process and I met with this publisher company uh, small press 
And she's like, we like this idea. Um, send me the full manuscript, and which I did, and they published, and they've done both of my children's books. So um, it all happened very quickly, very unexpectedly. Uh, I'm learning more about self-publishing. I really didn't even know what that was. Um, I, I like the benefit because since I am not a writer, because I know a lot of writers have an English background, um, know how to structure sentences as well, and that's has never been my forte. I'm, I was an accountant in my business career and numbers are my thing. So I like the uh, traditional because they provided such great editors for me. And my when I started this and still um, needed a lot of work. Um, and my publisher still says to me to this day, she's like, you have an issue with comments. It's like, yes, I know, thank you. Um, and we joke about that. And, and that benefited me where I think nothing wrong with self-publishing I think that would have been a big downside for me that that's not my forte so I need somebody and yes you can hire people to do the editing but I didn't even know how to go about doing that so um, my publisher is 4RV Publishing and that's the number four uh, the letter R and the L, um, letter V is in Victor Publishing, um, and they're out of um, Oklahoma City here. And it's just been a really ble uh, big blessing. The other two books uh, she didn't publish for me, and that's just because, again, by the grace of God, um, I was post during COVID, I was posting prayers every day. And I had a publisher approach me and said, have you ever thought of doing a prayer journal? I said, no, but let's talk. And so um, my other books came out by a different publisher just because of that type of situation. But and my next kid's book is also coming from Art for RV. I love working with them. And it's been a real blessing for me. I've learned so much. All right. Uh, we had a question in the chat about how do you put your uh, self, bring out your inner child so that you can write from a child's point of view when you write your stories. So we'll go back to Phyllis and let you answer that. Putting on your inner child to write your story. <laughs> well, I uh, actually always write in my inner child voice. I think I can't really write very well for adults. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this, but. You know, we've all got an inner child, so um, you need to get in tune with that that entity inside of you. And how are you could do that? Like, I don't know, watch kid movies, read kid books, or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chelsea. Definitely play with kids. Yeah. Definitely hang out with kids. Like, <laughs> listen to the noises that they make. Ask them questions about the things you're interested in writing, because. Uh, when I was writing my first book, it started off with like, I knew I wanted like monster sounds. And I asked my daughter, like, but I wanted it to be about things around the house. So I was like, what do you think a vacuum cleaner sounds like? And she gave me a different sound than what I thought. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I kept asking her different questions and we were going through different things and it, it all finally came together, but it, it definitely would not have been what it is if I hadn't you know, been playing with her in that specific kind of way. Cause I'm not, I feel like I kind of lost my creativity from childhood a little bit, but um, being able to, to be intentional with play with kids has helped a ton with writing. Okay, Becky, would you like to address this one? I would just, I would just have to say um, that as a mother and reading um, voraciously to four children through their growing up years. Um, I even did some read alouds when, when they would become teenagers. Uh, they'd be embarrassed uh, for me to say that if they were listening to this, but we did so many read alouds and we would just keep that going even, even when they became teenagers. And then I was a teacher and did read alouds, you know, as a, as a sixth grade teacher and um, and that now with my grandchildren, uh, I just do a lot of reading. And so when it came time for me to start thinking about how to formulate a children's book that the young readers would enjoy, I had some ideas, I, I think, already that um, I, I knew that I would need to incorporate certain kinds of pieces, like with the conflict and what children are looking for when they're reading and, and how they can 
relate to the conflict and work through it, and what kind of characters they're looking for, and just even what kind of um, language and word choices and things like that. Not that I had it all together, I, I didn't. I was on a learning curve with that, but um, I think I had some real basic um, knowledge of just all the, all the reading I've done through the years to my own kids and, and my grandkids. Yeah. Yvonne? Same, it's a lot of the same type answers. I um, read to my kids all as they were growing up. And then also um, I read a lot and now I read to my grandchildren. So it was a lot of looking at those stories and then looking at some of the issues that our kids are dealing with in life. Um, my fir first children books, The Sad Little Wildflower, you know, so many kids are growing up feeling like does God love me the way I am? And so that started an idea and on, I blog weekly and on one of my blogs, I wrote a story um, and somebody pointed out, it's like, this would make a really good children's story. Um, and so then I went for that up as we were going through the edits, I did have to tone down some of the words because they were for an older child, mine's a picture book, you know? And so it's a, it's a learning curve again of what, you want to stretch a child to learn other words, but you also don't want to make it a word that is beyond them. Um, we do in both of my, in my books in the back have some additional pages to help out with that, especially my ABC from ABCs from the Bible. We go into what some of these different terminologies mean just to help parents be able to then use these as teaching tools for their kids. And as a teacher, I don't think I ever left my childhood behind. I, I got down and played with the kids and and I think that influenced the writing I've done for children that it's, um, you just have to get into their world. And uh, it's been mentioned, read, read other children's books mm -hmm. and um, you know hang out with the kids. Uh, we have another question from the chat um, about marketing your book. Or, how have you marketed your book and is there low cost options that you've used? So let's go back to Phyllis. Well, um, yeah, in an ideal world, you would be published by one of the large publishing companies and they might have a budget, but that eludes most of us, you know, like if you have a small press or if you're self-publishing, you got to you're the one who pays for the Facebook ads or whatever they are. So um, I uh, well, I listen to this podcast called Novel Marketing with Thomas Unstat, Umstat Jr., who's a homeschool graduate. And uh, I get a lot of good tips from that, I got to tell you. So, you know, have a website, have a... Uh, a newsletter list on your website, give away some kind of a freebie on my website. I'm giving away a free short story that's written for kids. And so then people will sign up and there's just various ways you can put that sign up in front of people. You can run ads, you can um, use book funnel or I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to get too detailed, but, but the more you can have your own newsletter list, the better off you are. And uh, then locally, you know, uh, there's a lot of local oomph for authors. If you live in any kind of a, I don't know, if you don't live out in the boonies, you, you can probably get your local indie bookstore to help promote you. And um, of course there's Facebook ads. Oh, another avenue I'm trying is uh, trying to put in for a lot of awards. Mm -hmm. my, my book is a type of book that sometimes gets awards so if that is the case then, and you have awards you can go around saying oh it's award winning which I can do now I'm so happy about that but anyway um, that's that's helpful to, to set yourself apart from the crowd in any way you can that's one way you can do that um, doing read alouds at schools is a good idea. Um, it can be free or a lot of schools have budgets for them. So if you're strategic, you know the terminology. Natalie, and you know the terminology, um, you can get your way in there. Um, 
getting on other people's platform is a really good idea. So if you could do an IG live with someone who reviews books or you know posts books or is um, a part of your audience, that's a really good one. Um, yeah, Facebook ads are tricky. Those I would not go for <laughs> in the beginning, especially. Those are very, very, very costly. Um, but yeah, the book awards, the associations, getting to know other authors and sharing their platform, building your email list, like Scylla says, those are all really um, effective, low cost, um, definitely good ways to build your audience up to, to market your book. All right, Becky. Yeah, I would just agree with um, the other ladies that um, I've done all of those things. And um, what I did not know when I got, got on this writing path is that the marketing would be up to me. And I, that's just the day and age that we live in. 25 years ago, that was not so much the case. Um, um, authors were just expected to write their books and publishers publish them and the publishers you know, to the marketing side, but that has, has flip-flopped through the years, and now it's an expectation, and, um, but yeah, I just look for all kinds of opportunities to get on other authors' platforms, and to do some swapping of um, guest blogging. Um, I, I look for those opportunities where I can be a guest blogger, but then I will reciprocate. I look for opportunities to do little book talks at, um, uh, before COVID, I was doing quite a bit of that at um, schools, and um, but I think that is going to start opening up again uh, now. I actually participated in a career fair today at my granddaughter's um, school, and so I had a table set up as an author and had my books on display, and and so um, I look for opportunities like that. Um, and once again, just. Um, setting yourself apart as far as um, uh, writing the kinds of books that are maybe a little bit more unique and a little bit different and sharing with friends and family is just simply huge. <laughs> I do that all the time. And um, it was never my goal to make money. Um, you know, that was just not my, my goal. Um, and so I love it when I can purchase um, my own books from the publisher and then donate mm -hmm. um, because I feel like that exposure is out there. So I have, I've got my books, you know, in our public library and I've donated to a number of schools and schools are just always thrilled to get, to get a book, to add to their inventory. And especially when it's donated. Yeah. Yvonne. Um, yep, and the, all the ladies before me had some great ideas. Some of the different things I do, I also participate, especially this time of year, in a lot of book fairs and festivals where I can set up a table and especially children's books seem to sell well when people can pick them up and hold them and look at them. Um, and then there's a lot of websites out there, Goodreads, um, library thing and a lot of those and I'm you know if I find a good website that I can sign up and have an author's page on there I have that so that you know you're getting your name out there I blog weekly now it's not directed just at children um, you know but just having a presence on social media as much as possible okay Alrighty, let's see if I can think of another question. How are we doing on time, Cindy? She must not be listening. Sorry, I'm here. Yeah, okay. we're, we're doing great. You've got to eight, so got plenty. Alrighty, okay. So, Pat Chris has a question. Okay. So I'm just wondering, I know some of you had said that you, you donate to schools and I don't like, are you talking about Christian schools or public schools? And if so, how do you get a Christian children's book in your, you know, I'm assuming like there's gospel in it or something. How do you get a Christian children's book? Or are you talking about Christian schools when you donate? Like how do you get those in the library? You know, uh, with my books, they're not really um, Christian. They're published by a Christian publisher and they're just wholesome, just 
pull some good, okay. good books. All right. <laughs> so, so there's nothing, um, you know, you know, as far as, you know, I like a gospel message. That. And so I don't have any trouble, you know, donating to, uh, to public schools. Um, uh, but I would say if you have a, a book, that's a, a, a Christian book that it's, if you talk to the librarian, it just depends on, um, you know, mo most public schools will take any kind of a book uh, because legally they're su supposed to, and there's a flip side of the coin that it's great to get those Christian books in there and, and some really wholesome, good quality literature books, but they have then also have some that, you know, go against our, our beliefs as believers. So, um, so I, the best thing is just to talk to the librarian and it just depends on their school and, and what they're willing to take or not take. Okay. And I have with mine, because they are very, um, a very Christian message, and I have run into a lot of problems of getting them into any public schools. A lot of public schools will let authors do readings, but I've not been able to make that connection. So I focus on churches that have um, after school programs, Mother Day Out, um, Sunday schools. And um, when I come across, um, we have different neighborhoods where you see the little free book libraries. I always have some books in my car and I'll stick my books in there. Um, Cause same thing, it's good to give them away. Um, and so, cause I'm not looking to get rich from doing any of this. Um, so there are ways it just becomes a little more difficult in the secular world with a true Christian message. Do you want to after that or? I I mean my books are on emotions and I talked to a Christian school but um I didn't like pursue it I was brand new to what I was doing and so I didn't pursue it further but they were interested um <laughs> so that, that was at least hopeful but um yeah I haven't I haven't gone too far with that. I keep jumping to things so I'm just getting back out there marketing the books mm -hmm. yeah I think Chelsea, with yours, there's a, I just retired from teaching and there's a big push for the social emotional learning and your books would probably work, you know, at the pri lower primary level for, for that. Well, thank oh, you for I, that. Yeah. So let's see <laughs> your hand or are you just thinking? Hey, uh, yeah, I do have a thought. My thought is I, before you sit down to write your book, you need to decide how Christian you want it to be because our culture has gotten so far away from us that, you know, in other words, if you have a come to Jesus moment in there, um, it will close doors for you. But what if you can kind of skate around it, you know, just kind of be very subtle, be very winsome. It's kind of tricky, you know, got to figure out how that might work in your story. So my book has an angel in it, but he's not, I mean, it's sort of like Clarence. He's a Clarence kind of an angel. So It's a Wonderful Life is not really considered a Christian movie, right? So, uh, anyway. Yeah, I've read a lot of Middle Grade lately, and I think that um, there are a lot of authors who don't label themselves as Christian authors who are putting Christ in their books. And yeah. those books are out there and they're being accepted. And mm -hmm. um, there was one, um, it was something about a wish I picked up a couple of years ago at um, the Books A Million and it was on their recommended shelf. This is our featured book, this is a great book. And it was about a young girl who was put in foster care with her a distant relative way out in the country. She'd been a city kid. And part of the main thing was they went to vacation Bible school. They went down to the local church and um, she grew to like the people at the church and like going to church. And that was never <laughs> labeled as a Christian <clears throat> book, but it's there, it's there. Yeah, yeah. so there's an art to, you know, like how, what can I say that won't offend the people who like to be offended, you know? <laughs> well, so many of the, like I said, so many of the books that are published have some kind of 
faith at least touched on. Yep. Yeah. So. Speaking of that, do you have, um, I'm going to ask each of our panel, even if it's not an overt faith theme, do you, what theme, what heart lies in your featured book that you uh, like um, the, the reader to take away for their lives? How about you, Phyllis? Well, um, yeah, the main takeaway from my book is uh, basically reach out. Uh, beyond your comfort zone, mm -hmm. reach out and make a friend. And if everybody did that, the world would be so much better off. But if we, you know, hide behind our comfort zones, uh, that's good. Okay. And there, the faith message, I guess, is that you know there's a benevolent power in in charge of your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chelsea. Um, I would say that the main message in my book is that all of our emotions are okay. It is totally fine and healthy to feel, and we just have to find different ways to manage them, but it's totally okay to feel. I know a lot of people, including myself, who grew up um, being told, you know, if you're not happy, something's wrong with you, and that was very damaging, so the reason I wrote these books and created the game is to help people understand that emotions are healthy and necessary and okay and normal and natural. And we just need to find healthy ways to manage them and for adults to teach that to their kids moving forward. Becky? Yeah, I think with my books, um, my takeaway is that um, there's conflict and in the end, there's, there's resolution. And so for young readers, I hope that they grasp um, at some level that the little skirt have a problem and, and then the harmonica have a, have a problem too. But in the end, everything worked out. It was, you know, the, con the conflict got worked out. And I, I think that's how life is. And I just think at a child's level, I think they'll pick up on that in, in the books that I've written. Yvonne? Yep, and mine are mine's teaching the alphabet through using biblical terms to define. For example, A is for angels who guard us day and night. B is for the Bible, which shows us God's light. And so they're, you know, it's very Christian themed oriented. <laughs> I know my when my grand I read it or my children read it to my grandkids that they're getting basis for their, uh, not only are they learning their ABCs, but they're learning the basis of faith. There was a question in the chat about illustration. I know if you have a traditional publisher, they probably help you with that. Uh, did any of you have to find your own illustrator? Yep. Chelsea, I got on really, I got really, really, really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I got really lucky. So when I was reading my husband's book, I was scrambling because um, I wanted to have it done by Christmas. And I started the process in, I want to say it was August or September, maybe even October of that year. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I've never done this before, but I'm going to do it. And so I found her on Fiverr and she was so sweet. I was terrified to send her the story because I'd heard so many like terrible things about illustrators on there. But she was so kind. And um, when the story got out about like the background of why he had a book and all that stuff, uh, she reached out to me. I think I found her on Instagram and she reached out to me. I was like, someone was looking for you. I was like, I found them. And I'm so glad to find you off of Fiverr. So she has done all of my books, all of my husband's books and my card game and a majority of my clients because I'm like, I found someone. She has her own company. She's in Argentina. She is such an angel. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really scary to find somebody that you can trust over the internet, you know, and you, you're paying them all this money, <laughs> hoping that they're going to give you something, right? So I, I was very blessed to find her. Like, I thank God for her all the time. She considers us family. Like, she's just awesome and amazing. But I know not everybody has that experience. So I always advise people to look for reviews, look for a real face, talk to other people. Um, 
Ugh, don't go into it blindly and do not rush. Do not rush that part. If you're going to rush it, use a site like Fiverr. So if you do get screwed over, excuse my language, but it happens. If somebody does do that, they steal your money, you can get it back. But I just saw a story all over probably five or six Facebook groups about a guy who kept saying he was going to give this woman her illustrations in January. She has not, well, she just got them because she blasted him out and he just threatened to sue her. But she was like, how are you going to sue me when you told me you were going to give me this stuff a long time ago? So that kind of stuff happens, especially when you rush. So just make sure that you, you check out reviews, look for a real face, make sure they're a real person and that they have reputable stuff and they can do the work that you're asking for. But ooh, do not rush that process. Yvonne, and, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, my first book, I went out on Fiverr and got somebody. Um, even though I'm doing traditional publishing, the, um, they do several different children's authors. And what the holdup ends up being is they only have so many artists on staff. And so sometimes there's a delay and it's a six, eight month waiting period to get the illustrations. So um, now for ABCs of the Bible, I used their artist um, and she did a wonderful job um, for my for my first children's book. I went to Fiverr, as I said, and then for this next one, as you get more into the children's publishing world, I've seen a gentleman out there that does these great artworks that I just have loved. He's a Christian man. Um, and one day I approached him and he said, okay, send me, you know, what your book will be about. And so he's doing my artwork for my next book. And again, that's more to speed up the process a little bit. Like Chelsea says, I'm not trying to rush it, but I know I don't want my book sitting in the backlog because we're waiting on the illustration when all the other edits are done. And so I'm paying, and I love this guy's work. So I'm real excited. He sent me, I think I'm on, I've gotten four so far out of the 10 that he's doing and I just love them, so. See, well, you found someone that you can yeah. trust that's reputable. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's yeah. good. That's, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. I have a question for uh, Chelsea. Um, Chelsea, what kind of card game do you have? Yeah, so it's a card game that um, teaches, have you seen the emotion wheel or the feelings wheel? It has like three layers to it. I know a lot of people haven't seen it before. I've been using it like my whole life because I've always been in like a mental health space. So, <laughs> but it's a wheel that has 130 total emotions on it. And so I took that wheel. I got permission from the creator of it. That's why it was a God thing that I even had this idea, this vision for this game. Uh, but I, I created 130 kid-friendly definitions for those words and then created, um, uh, oh gosh, sorry, 100 different behavior regulation activities that they can do. And so then I made a condensed version of the game that just has 48 of those emotions and 10 of the behavior regulators. But it just teaches kids definitions for their emotions so they can put words to it. Uh, we've been teaching our oldest daughter, she's five now, about her emotions since she was about one. And she, she's very emotionally intelligent. And I'm very grateful for that. It's difficult because she's very strong-willed like I am. And she will let you know exactly how she feels at any moment, which is beautiful. But sometimes it's like, just get out of my face with that. But I want her, I always said, when my kids grow up, if they do nothing else, I want them to know their emotions because I want them to grow up to be healthy mentally, have healthy relationships and be able to navigate the world, you know, in a, in a healthy mental space, because a lot of people don't do that. And the repercussions are, are just not very good. So um, it, it's a fun game. It can be intense at times, especially um, going through some of the more challenging words, but it's been very helpful. Like she told me today that she was miserable because I made her sit down on her butt in her chair for dinner. Like for real, she told me she was miserable. And I said, oh, okay. And the other day, well, it was a few months ago, she looked at the TV and was like, oh, they look dismayed. And I was like, oh, they do, don't they? Sorry. So yeah, it's a fun it's game. A it's a good game. Time. I, I know. <laughs> notice that it's fun. <laughs> I get very passionate about emotions. I love this. Oh, yeah. So now, that's the game. A, there's a, a true school market for that. So investigate with school psychologists. Yep. And yep, we're definitely. probably going to be shut off here in just a minute and be headed back to the um, uh, other room. So thank you all very, very much. For thank you, Betty, for moderating. Yep, thank you. <laughs> if everyone is ready, I will stop the recording. If not, anyone else has anything to add? Okay.
I enjoyed hearing hearing from all the other authors. Yep. And if you're pursuing publishing a kid's book, keep up with it. We need lots of them. I'm gonna hit the stop button. <laughs>